Welcome to the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. We invite you to like us on Facebook, the voice crying in the wilderness. You can um, email us at azooc2019 at gmail.com. Or you may go to our website. The Voice of One Crying in the Wilderness dot com. On our Facebook page, you can download all of our messages. On our email and our website, you can go there and request a message to be emailed to you. And for this hour, our speaker is Pastor Michael Martin. The next voice that you will hear giving us our opening prayer and our message will be that of Pastor Martin. Trust that you have had a good day thus far. Um, praise God, we have covered already the first six chapters of Daniel. Uh, however, um, you must understand that in studying Daniel, you can go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into each one of these books. So I'm I'm giving you more or less a thumbnail sketch. We're going to go, however, much deeper in chapters 7 through 12. So um, at this time, we're in Daniel chapter 7. Um, so I trust that you would um, take some notes. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a very amazing chapter, very important. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, they are reflective one of the other. One is dealing with the metals, showing you the four great kingdoms, and the other is dealing with the beast, showing you the four great kingdoms, and coming all the way down from the time of Babylon to our to our day. So let's take a moment to pray, and then we'll get right into the word. Father in heaven, we are humbled as we ask for light and strength and understanding. As we open your word, we ask that you would open our understanding and give us the ability to rightly understand your word. We pray for the residing power of the Holy Spirit to rest upon us, cause us to see clearly the revealed truth of your word. Change our characters to what they should be. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 7, <clears throat> and we're starting in verse 1, and the scripture says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had dreamed, had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed, and he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. So, very interesting that this same king, Belshazzar, uh, that was um, put to death during the night of his uh, wild party, um, that during that same time, before that time, uh, Daniel was receiving visions and dreams concerning the last days. So Babylon was still in power. Medo-Persia was not yet in power. And here is, here is the dream. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. 
All right. So if we if we go to um, Revelation chapter 17, we're going to be connecting the dots in between these two books in Revelation 17 and verse 15 we will see a statement. Revelation 17 and verse 15, And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, so the sea, of course, is made out of water, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Okay, so let's go right back to Daniel 7, and we'll read verse 2 again. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, And behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. This is, this sea is talking about peoples. It's talking about the European nations. There was a striving of these powers. All right? Um, go with me to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 32. Jeremiah 25 and verse 32. And the scripture says, Thus saith the Lord of hope, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. All right? So so it's, it's talking about this striving among the nations. Also, in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 19, dealing with the same principle, 23 and verse 19, Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. So we see that this, 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 Wind, these these four winds from the north, east, south, and west, nations striving uh, for power. They are striving very much for power. Another text that deals with that is Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 7. And verse 1, notice what it says. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor sea, nor any tree. So angels are holding in check the fierce passions of wrath and war uh, and and bloodshed and contest and contention in between nations. Don't think for one moment that that Russia is the friend of America and that China is the friend of America because they are diametrically opposed one to the other. The principles of our nation, even though those principles are gradually dying, the principles of our nation stands against the principles of China and Russia. Those nations are basically godless in their belief and in their teaching. Uh, the teachings of, of, of freedom uh, and liberty, um, those teachings come from the scriptures. And that's what the original founders of America had, notwithstanding the sins that were in them and their owning slaves and all of that. We understand all of that, but the but the principles of the scriptures were still put forth on pen and paper uh, in the Declaration of Independence and these other uh, these other documents, um, uh, which which now people are seeking to take to task. All right, so go with me a little further. Um, let's go um, to verse three, and it says, "For beasts." came up from the sea, diverse one from the other. So we already discussed the sea. So let let me make it very clear to you so you can see these beasts. So please connect 
Daniel chapter 7 and verse 3 with Daniel chapter 7 and verse 17. Notice what it says. <coughs> Pardon me. It says, these great beasts are four, are four kings which shall arise out, out of the earth. So, <coughs> pardon me. If you are a king, then you must of necessity have a kingdom. So a kingdom is a nation. So these beasts, you don't have to be afraid of these beasts because they represent kingdoms. They represent they represent nations. Um, go with me to um, Zechariah chapter seven. Zechariah, <coughs> pardon me. Zechariah chapter seven and verse fourteen. Zechariah chapter seven and verse. 14, and the scripture says, but I scattered them with a whirlwind among the nations, among all the nations, excuse me, whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them that no man passed through nor returned, for they lay the pleasant land. Notice this now, the pleasant land, desolate. That was the promised land. That was Canaan land. That was the land that God had said he would give to the children of Israel. All right? Go with me now to verse 4. So this is the first uh, kingdom. This is the Babylonian kingdom. It's represented in this particular text as a lion. And a lion, so it is said, is the king of the jungle. All right? And so Babylon was the king of the nations. It was the most superior, the most uh, advanced, and, and, and all of these things, and each one of them uh, decreased uh, in moral worth as you go from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to, to pagan Rome to papal Rome. All right, verse 4 says, <clears throat> The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, so its conquest was very quick. That's what the eagle's wings represent. It represents speed. Continuing in that same verse, I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, no more wings, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. All right, so <clears throat> let's look at the heart of man. Go with me to Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10. Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10. Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10, and the scripture says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is this is mankind in his natural state. This is how we are born. Uh, we are born <clears throat> with a heart that has a tendency, a proclivity, uh, a bend and uh an inclination, a propensity towards evil. I didn't say that we were born sinning. I said we have a, a bend towards it. So it's very easy for a young child to learn to sin. Notice what verse 10 says. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. That's the thoughts. Even to give... Every man or every person, according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings, according to what he produces in his life, according to his deeds, according to his actions. <clears throat> so that was the condition of the uh, of Nebuchadnezzar, the, the ruler, 
of Babylon. All right, go with me to verse 5 now. This is the now the Medo-Persian kingdom. All right? And behold, another beast, a second, like unto a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. All right, and these three ribs that this bear had had overtaken. Okay, so so before um, Medo Persia took over Babylon, it had already taken over Egypt, Syria, and Libya. So it was a conquering nation. All right, and it says, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. So if you go back to Daniel 2 and verse 39, you see the same, um, this same nation, this same kingdom. Daniel 2 and verse 39, and after thee shall arise another. So, you know, so Daniel is talking to Nebuchadnezzar. And so he said, after his kingdom, after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. So he's talking about two kingdoms now. All right? He's talking about two kingdoms. The first one he talked about, he said, another inferior to thee, that's the Medo-Persian kingdom, and another third kingdom of brass, that's talking about Greece. And then, of course, if you went on to verse 40, the fourth kingdom that is talking about Rome. All right, so let's go back to, to Daniel 7, verse 5. We'll read it once again, and we'll go right into verse 6. And behold, another beast, a second like unto a bear, that's Medo-Persia, it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, and that's when it conquered Egypt, Syria, and Libya, before it conquered Babylon. Uh, and they said unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Verse 6 is the kingdom of Greece. Of course, this is Alexander the Great. And verse 6 says, After this I behold, I beheld, and lo, like uh, another, like a leopard. Now, a leopard is very fast. Now, this particular leopard, notice how it's described. So now the scripture says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his fox? They don't. They don't change. We can't peel our skin off. Those of us that are black or brown, we can't peel our skin off. And nobody else, no matter what color you are, you can't change your color. You might want to, you might try dyeing it, but it's not going to be very successful if you end up with all kinds of diseases doing that. After this, I beheld and lo, another like a leopard which had upon the back of it four wings. So it was twice as fast as Babylon. Babylon had two wings and four wings of a fowl. And the beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. So this four heads, when Alexander the Great died, four of his generals fought over uh, his territories and, and they ended up dividing it up into four uh, different pieces. And out of one of those arose of the Roman kingdom, and we'll see that later on. Okay, so that's verse 6. Let's go now to verse 7. Notice what it says. <clears throat> After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. Now notice these words describing this nation or this kingdom. This is the Roman kingdom around 168 B.C. Dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. It was called the Iron Kingdom, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue, stamped on the people of God. And it was diverse from all of the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. This is the ten divisions of the nations of Europe. So it's very, very, uh, 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 very, very significant. So let's go back now and let's look at some of the characteristics of these different 
kingdoms or nations. So Babylon was a nation that was involved in sun worship. Um, Babylon was a nation that was a persecuting power. Um, Babylon was a worldwide uh, empire, and so Babylon, the the king wanted to wanted for his kingdom to last forever, and that's why he made everything out of gold, because you know gold in their minds uh, represented something of eternal value. Then we have Medo Persia. Medo Persia. Uh, was a, another group that was against the people of God. And it had laws that could not be changed. Once those laws were on the books, that was it. They were there forever. Then Greece, Greece was involved also in sun worship. And Greece conquered much of the world by philosophy, our war as well as philosophy. Our educational system today, most most common educational systems, are after the order of Greece. Now, not true Christian education, because true Christian education has its foundation in the scriptures. So Martin Luther said that any school or college that is not primarily involved in exalting the scriptures as the standard uh, is a very dangerous place to send your children. And so this is why we have so many educated uh, infidels and unbelievers uh, because even quote-unquote Christian schools have these uh, principles of infidelity woven into their uh, system. So when you look at evolution, when you look at communism, um, all those things, they all tie together. Atheism, communism, evolutionism, they all tie together. So Christianity is completely opposed to such teaching. And this is why um, we should, the parents should be the primary educators of the children for the uh, first few years. And then after that, they should be sent to places where the principles of the word of God would be more deeply ingrained uh, in the minds and hearts of the youth. A teacher's position is just as sacred as that of a minister. And this is why so many children are, are unbelievers is because they have been educated by unbelievers. And so they pick up those principles. All right. Um, so as we look at verse 7, looking at the center of it, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and was diverse from all the beasts that were before. It was different. <clears throat> How was it different? Well, Rome had control of the government as well as religion. So the Caesars got to the point where they wanted they wanted worship. So once a year, you had to go before a magistrate, and you had to burn some incense in front of the statue Diana. And as you sprinkled that incense, you had to repeat the words, Lord, God, Caesar. That's what you had to say. If you didn't say it, uh, you could be put to death. So now, something happens to this beast. You have a, you have a, the Roman beast that is, uh, paganistic. 
Then when pagan Rome finally dies, you have the uh, rising up of the papal beast. And that's in verse 8. Notice what it says. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom three were, there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man in the mouth speaking great things. So very, very interesting, this this mouth that's speaking um, great things. And as we, as we analyze uh, later on, we will be able to see uh, what happens. All right, now in the territory where we had all of these kingdoms, you had the Alemanni, that's the Germans, the Franks, that's the French, the Burgundians, that's Switzerland, the Swivai, that's Portugal, the Vandals, that's Northern Africa, uh, the Visigoths, that's Spain, um, the Saxons, that's Britain, the Ostrogoths, that's Italy, the Lombards, that's Italy, and the Heruli, that's in Italy. So you can, you can see how these, these horns, uh, how they, how they stood. And uh, later on, of course, some of them were, they were done away with. And so we have this, this battle uh, of, of the, of the nations and, and Rome conquering the nations. Now let's read verse eight. Once again, I consider the horns. And behold, there came up among them another little horn. All right, so Rome, <clears throat> I'm talking about papal Rome, the Roman Catholic hierarchy, it raises up from among um, the, the, the ruins of the Grecian Empire uh, and from what is left of the, uh, of the Roman Empire. Um, and so the, the popes, in their writings, say very clearly, that they are a continuation of the reign of the Caesars. Now, I want to know why anybody would want to be a continuation of that, but that's what's in history. Behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So um, go with me to um, Daniel chapter 2. And verse 40, Daniel 2, Daniel chapter 2, and verse 40, we're doing real Bible study. This is more, more of a study than it is of a, of a sermon. Verse 40, in Daniel chapter 2, the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. In other words, makes, makes all kingdoms surrender to it. Follow that principle now. Breaks in pieces and subdues all things. It will actually the word things is actually italicized, so that was put in by the translators to try to, but it, it subdued all, subdued all kingdoms. So that's both of these kingdoms. That's the pagan kingdom as well as the papal kingdom. And as iron breaketh all these, it shall break in pieces and bruise. All right. So now go with me to. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2. Revelation 13. <clears throat> we are connecting the dots. Daniel and Revelation. Revelation 13 and verse 2. Uh, let's read verse 1 and 2. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, <clears throat> and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads. All right, remember a head is a nation. Remember that, that when Daniel was interpreting the vision to Nebuchadnezzar, he said, Thou art this head of gold. And so the heads 
are as follows. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, that's five. Number six, France. Number seven, America. Then when you go to Revelation 17, you have the eighth. That's the revival of Romanism or the revival of the obedience of the people around the world to the Roman Catholic hierarchy. All right, going on a little further. And ten horns, and upon his ten horns, ten crowns, that's the ten nations of Europe, and upon his heads, the name name of blasphemy. So each one of those heads, each one of those nations did something that was blasphemous to the name of God. All right, verse 2, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. <clears throat> so remember that the leopard was Greece. Greece uses philosophy. That's how many nations are swept over by philosophy. And his feet were like the feet of a bear. Medes and Persians, they have laws that cannot be changed. And his mouth, the mouth of a lion, that's Babylon, sun worship, uh, a, a persecuting, conquering power. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So the dragon primarily means Satan. Secondarily, it's Rome. Um, and uh, you can find that right there in in Revelation 12, verse 3, and also verse 9, all right? And the dragon gave him his power, so Rome, that's the, that's the Caesars, gave to the papacy his seat or his dwelling place. Where's the dwelling place? Vatican City. And so the whole world started to turn Toward, toward Rome um, after the demise of the Roman Empire of the Caesars. All right? So going a little further, <clears throat> go with me to Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Correct that in my notes quickly. Chapter 2, verses 3 to 12. Notice what it says. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Falling away of what? Falling away from biblical teaching, falling away from adherence to the scriptures, falling away from understanding the things of God that have been revealed to us through the scriptures, and many individuals come, come up with many different reasons and, and many different excuses for rejecting the scriptures, but at last, unfortunately, many will find that they have made a terrible mistake in rejecting the word of God. And the man of sin, that man of sin, be revealed, a sort of perdition, um, Protestants for many hundreds of years have known this text to apply directly to the Pope, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was what when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity, still talking about the Pope, it's, it's, it's mysterious that here's an individual that can say that they are holy, that can say that they're infallible, but really they're full of wickedness all the way up to their eyeballs. You know, and all you have to do is go back and look in history and look at all the millions upon millions upon millions of Christians that the Roman church put to death because they would not adhere to her doctrines this reigned all over Europe. So all you have to do is look at history. Look, Germany um, uh, was first uh, uh, Catholic. Then after that, 
Christian was Protestant, and then after that, what did you come to? You came to Hitler. And so it is amazing how Rome goes into a country, and later on, that country uh, uh, comes to a place of instability. It cannot be stable after they have power. Uh, uh, the French, uh, the French was uh, a Catholic. Italy, uh, Catholic. All these places in Europe, and this is why uh, America has been hated for many, many years because America is a a bastion for Protestantism, and Protestantism in America is almost completely dead, even as we speak. Um, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. So God allows things to run their course so that we can see clearly what it is that we are actually dealing with. Uh, verse 8, And then shall that which it be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them a strong, or God shall allow, either way, um, shall uh, a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. God doesn't want anybody to intentionally have a delusion, but when they reject truth, then he leads them to choose what they have chosen, which is a lie. That they might all might be damned who believe not in the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So many descriptives of the work of the papacy. Going with me back now to Daniel, to Daniel uh, chapter nine, um, chapter seven, and we are now in verse nine. Daniel chapter seven, and we are now in verse nine. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. So here we see Daniel speaking of the time of the judgment in which we are now living, which started, according to the Jewish calendar, the Hebrew calendar, and according to Daniel 9, and according to Revelation 14, and according to Revelation 10, um, that it is now the time of the judgment. There are many other texts. I'm just not bringing them out at this particular time. All right, so the judgment began October 22nd, 1844. It started with the uh, with the dead, and it will conclude with the living. Uh, the, the, the judgment of the living will begin at the enforcement of the National Sunday Law. The National Sunday Law is enforced because that is the test that the people of God will have to pass through before they are sealed. So this is why we must be diligently making preparation because it is coming much sooner than we think. So don't concentrate on who's in the White House because everybody that's in the White House, sooner or later, is going to have to bow their knees to Vatican City. So don't 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 get wrapped up in who's in the White House. Every one of them, they will be controlled by someone else. We have to make a choice to be controlled only by Christ. So we're dealing with the time of the judgment. We're dealing with the time of the atonement. The word atonement means at one minute. The time in which God is seeking to bring us into 
perfect harmony with himself. This is why Jesus is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. This is why in so many of our churches you hear so few sermons or messages or studies on these subjects because they have been educated in schools where the principles of the Word of God have gradually become eroded. And this is what we are dealing with. Notice, um, the judgment was set and the books were open. So let's, uh, let's progress just a little further and then we'll start looking at some of these texts that deal with uh, the judgment. Verse 11. And I beheld then because of the voice of the great words when the horn spake, I beheld till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So the beast is actually permanently destroyed at the end of the thousand years. That's when he's permanently destroyed. Of course, he's put out a commission by the seven plagues. And so in the sixth plague, when the scripture says that the uh, river Euphrates dried up, this means that people finally stopped giving to the fallen uh, systems of religion because they finally wake up. But unfortunately, they wake up too late. But it's their own choice. Everybody has a choice. You can wake up now if you want to, or you can continue to sleep, and then you can be aroused from your sleep when it's eternally too late. Verse 12, concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time, for just a little portion of time. So so the, the principles of Babylon, the principles of Medo-Persia, the principles of Greece, the principles of Rome, their lives are still prolonged in society. So you have you have football games and soccer games and baseball games and basketball games. What is that? That is the Roman and the Greek amphitheaters. That's the, that's those are the gladiator sports. So that's that's still being they're still being uh, their lives are prolonged. You have a Greek educational system. Greece is still prolonged. You have in America laws that cannot come off the books. That's the Medes and the Persians. The Iron Age, you know, so what do we have? We have iron tanks, and we have uh, 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 iron airplanes, and, and we have uh, iron bullets, and, uh, and and bombs made out of steel, and all this. Um, Rome is still in existence. It's still, it's still functioning. It's just in another guise. Same principle. Same warlike, bloodthirsty, conquering principle that if you don't adhere then you'll be put out of existence. Verse 12. We just read verse 12. Let's go, to, let's go to verse 13. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So, so still dealing with the judgment, all of this together, still dealing with uh, the judgment. Verse 14, and there was given him a dominion and glory and kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that will shall not be destroyed. So this, this uh, 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 comes to its fulfillment, verse 14, comes to its fulfillment at the second coming. So let's back up to verse 13. Remember, we're dealing with the judgment. Some of the some of the, the, the texts dealing with the judgment. So go with me to Matthew 25. We won't, we won't read all of it, but we'll touch, touch on some portions of it. Matthew 25 is actually dealing with the judgment. Matthew 25, that's the five wise and the five foolish virgins. That's what it is. Notice what it says. Starting in verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. 
Five of them were wise and five were foolish. So God is letting you know that at least half of the church won't make it. Not because he, not because he wanted it to be that way, but because individuals do not take the time to surrender themselves to Christ. They that were foolish took their lamps, the lamps, that's your Bible, took no oil with them. They did not have a sufficient supply of the Holy Spirit. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. All right? So, you know, just just a, a touch on it. Um, go with me to, in that same area, verse 12. No, verse 10. And while they went to buy. No, let's go to verse 8. Let's go to verse 8. I don't want to skip that. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. So there will come a time. When the people of God have agonized before God, and as they have agonized before God, God will give them a portion of the Holy Spirit that they have never had before. For those individuals that will not take the time for prayer and for study and for self-examination will not receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Those individuals that don't receive will ask those that have received, you know, give us the Holy Spirit. And those that have will say, well, we can't give it to you. You have to get that from God yourself. Notice what it says. But the wise answered, saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. In other words, we can't give it to you. But go ye rather to them that sell. They're talking about the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Go to them that sell and buy for yourselves. All right, we're going to come back to this text, but I want you to go with me to 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 Isaiah. I think it's Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. I think we want to start in verse 1. Yes, Isaiah 55 in verse 1. Then we'll go back to Matthew 25. Notice now. O oh, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine. That's talking about doctrine. Milk, that's talking about doctrine for babies. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. So how do you do that? You go to Christ. And you say, Lord, would you please take my life? And you give your life to God, and God gives back to you grace and truth and power and wisdom and steadfastness. Let's go back now to Matthew 25. We're just touching on just a few texts that deal with the judgment. Just a few texts. Notice what it says. Verse 9 again in Matthew 25. The wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us in you, but go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. Verse 10. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. The door was sh- uh, to the marriage, and the door was shut. What is this talking about? This is actually a picture of right during Right at the time of the National Sunday Law, people see that the test has come upon them. They have made no preparation. And now they want to make preparation at the last moment, and they find that it's too late. Because they have fittered away their time, buying cars and houses and getting better jobs and dealing with the stock market and and, and, and going to the football games and the baseball games and the basketball games and not taking time to pray, and not taking time to study. And, and, and spiritual people, they call the spiritual people fanatics. They all, well, I don't want to be bothered with them fanatics. You know, they don't eat the way we eat. They, you know, they, they dress different. You know, they, you know, uh, uh, they won't, uh, uh, they won't tell the children about Santa Claus and all that kind of stuff. So they miss out. Because the world has been more important than the things of God. So, 
Let's go back now to Daniel. Back now to Daniel chapter 7. It's obvious we won't get through this chapter today, but we'll do the best we can. So Daniel chapter 7, still touching on some of these texts that deal with the judgment. So go with me to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 which is the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3, and let's start in verse 1. Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now here's the question, and this is the, this is dealing with the judgment. But who shall abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth, he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. So what does a refiner's fire do? What does it what what does what does it accomplish? It refines uh the gold and the silver. That's what it does. It refines it. And so when you look at something that's hot enough uh to refine, it is it is it is got to be something that will that will actually purify so it purifies this this fire purifies so what is the fire that purifies it is the fire of trial and test temptation and tribulation it is that which we really don't like but who may abide the day of his coming who shall stand when he appeareth for he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. You probably don't know anything about fuller soap, but you probably know something about lye soap. So back in the old days, a lot of people, they didn't get a hold of bleach, but they got a hold of lye, and you would, they would put so much lye you know, uh, in, their, in their wash, and that, that would, in turn, they would boil it. And you're talking about white sheets and white shirts and white socks, and, you know, everything would be white. So the purification process. Notice what it says now. This is talking about Jesus. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and shall purify the sons of Levi and shall purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem, this is talking about the church, be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against the false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages. Uh Uh-oh, that's that's a dangerous deal, the hireling in his wages. How many people that just don't want to pay anybody what they're worth? Uh, the, press the hiring in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. So this is, this is what we are looking at right now, is the, is the time of judgment. We have a few more texts that we will look at just before we close. We have just a few minutes. All right, let's go a little further. A few more texts dealing with the judgment. We are in the time of the judgment. Um, let's go to Matthew 22 and verse 11. Matthew. 22 and verse 11. Of course, this is uh, 
this is the king holding a feast uh, for his son. And it, and it says in verse 2, Matthew 22 in verse 2, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage feast for his son. Of course, and as you read it, what he's talking about, that the first people that he invites is the Jews. And then he goes out and, and invites them again. And, 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 they, and then he says, well, go invite, you know, just go into the highways and byways. And then in verse 11, um, verse 10 and 11, so those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Verse 11, and when the king came to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment, and said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. So the so the wedding garment is a symbol of the righteousness of Christ. We cannot produce it. We must only accept it and receive it as a gift. This is what this is what we must do. We must receive it as a gift. But if we are not if we don't receive it, the righteousness of Christ as a gift, then we are looked upon as spiritually naked. So um next week we will we will continue uh in the book of Daniel um right where we left off. We got oh I guess about halfway through this chapter. You see these these chapters are very deep. That's why I'm really taking time with them so you can see their significance. So we, we, would, we would take up again in verse 15 of Daniel 7. So I trust, beloved, that we would, we would take time to take these things seriously to heart, to surrender ourselves to God, not to man, and to be sure that our calling and election is sure. Let us pray as we close. Father in heaven, we're thankful. Once again, for your word, for your love, your kindness, and your mercy. And we ask that we would be fully surrendered to thee. Take control of our hearts, minds, souls, wills, beings, desires, wants, joys, pleasures. Take control of us, Lord, that we might be found worthy to stand before you without fault. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Martin. Appreciate that message. You know, I hope we all um, take it to heart. I know I will because it's, it's, it's so important, especially in the times that we live, you know, to seek that righteousness of Christ, to have it you know, to recognize our, our shortcomings and and especially the times that we're in now. And um, for anyone, anyone would like to share it uh, with a loved one, a friend, uh, you can do so uh, by dialing 712-775-7089. And the same uh, PIN code you used to dial in, 555-145-POUND. Also, um, for those that are requesting prayer, you can use those same avenues, you know, our Facebook, um, our email, our website, or you may contact Sister Jackie at 773-415-1562. And in closing, we'd like to wish everyone, and may you be a blessing to someone and receive a blessing from on high. And in closing, amid discord and strife, a voice was heard from the wilderness, a voice startling and stern yet full of hope. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Desire of Ages, page 104. 
continue to have a peaceful rest of the day.